I actually distinctly remember writing this music while watching television, uh-huh. and I wrote it by mistake. I think I was at my computer and I had something on TV, like on the on the computer. I was just yeah. watching it. I was just like, I was, I was trying to write another piece. Yeah. Then I had a delay running, and I was just like not even thinking about it, just like <laughs> arpeggiating stuff. Yeah. And then this, this is what came out. Came out, and I was like, whoa, I really like this. This is really pretty. Yeah. And so then that was in like 2010. And then like two years later, I had this commission to write this this piece for piano forehand and string quintet uh-huh. and I, I decided to use that piano idea and I ended up writing this piece right so yeah. the first two minutes is just the piano doing it yeah. and then I just wrote the string part that comes out on top of it This is Robert Hohenstein, one of my favorite composers. His music strikes an incredible balance between surprise and predictability, and it grooves like a hot potato. Composer collective Sleeping Giant teamed up with the chamber ensemble 8th Blackbird and made an awesome album called Hand Eye, which was one of my favorites of 2016. Amazingly, about a year later, I found myself in his office learning all about his writing process, and guess what? I filmed the whole thing just for you. I hope you enjoy. Robert is very humble when he talks about his intuitive and free approach to composition, but when you listen to his music, it's apparent that he's got mad skills and he really knows how to connect with a listener. I think it's been a long time. It's taken me a while to to get any degree of confidence in myself as a musician. Um, It's just, I'm very hard on myself. I'm a perfectionist, and especially when I was in school, I just, you know, maybe because, like, that's an environment where you're you're learning and Mm -hmm. you're surrounded by you know, people, other people who are also learning and teachers who are kind of telling you what to do. I just kind of always felt like I, I didn't know enough or I wasn't good mm-hmm. enough or whatever. And I think that affected my process because it just took me longer to do things. And um, I, doubt, I had a lot more doubt about mm-hmm. it. And I mean, I definitely still, the thing is, I still have all those doubts and all those feelings, but I'm a little bit better at just ignoring them. Yeah. You know, when I need to. What are the, what are some things you really doubt while you're writing? Like, is it, what are some of like the existential oh, threats? <laughs> yeah, I wish my wife was here because she could talk to you about it. <laughs> she's my, the first person I talk to. And I, t- I sort of got, she's so sick of me. It happens in every single piece. There is a point where I'm just like, I'm convinced that I'm complete, like, crap composer. Okay. And that the piece is like terrible garbage and like I'm like a total fraud. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's, I, that always happens. Yeah. I think they call it imposter syndrome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and she's the one that I go to and like have my like, woe yeah. is me moment. And she's always yeah. like, oh my God. She's like, I've heard this story like 20 <laughs> times already. Do you think that might be because in time you end up only hearing your finished work and you kind of forget like the crappy in between phase yeah I think there's part of that definitely and um, I don't think I forget the crap in between because I'm always working mm-hmm. so it's never far from my memory at that point the next but it next still step. happens because like after like, definitely there's a cycle with the piece where it's like the initial phases are just like oh experimental I can try anything anything's possible this is so fun and easy yeah. and then you finally kind of are on a path and you're like actually writing something and then it gets hard because you're like wow I gotta really figure out what's gonna happen now yeah. Um, and then and that's when you start to get into the difficulties and then when you finally get through the other side and you're like close to finish and it's like almost done it's like feels great you're just like yeah I've made this thing and like I'm excited about it yeah and then and then you know when it, people play it and blah 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 that's like also exciting so yeah you definitely are on a high 
at the end of that process, and then you start again, and you're like, oh, facing the demon again. Wait a second. <laughs> well, like, what is a crap composer, really? Like, you know what I mean? Like, what, no, like, what is the version of yourself that would be crap? That's so funny. That's mm-hmm. actually a great question to ask, yeah. and I don't know. I, like, I don't know. It's an interesting... I, don't, I have to unpack it, but it's like... I guess it's like... I always think, oh, it's too boring. It's too simple. Mm-hmm. It's too obvious. Yeah. And there are times where I will get rid of a whole bunch of stuff because I realize I've just made it too complicated. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Um, and I don't, I don't, I, lo- I engage with, I like the aesthetic of minimalism. I mm-hmm. love the sound of it. And, um, but I don't necessarily, I'm not a process composer. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like a lot of minimalist composers, there's systems or processes mm-hmm. at work that's kind of like driving mm-hmm. music. Um, and I kind of like, I've always sort of said I like the sound of a process, but not necessarily an actual process. That's interesting. Process. You know That's what I mean? cool. Yeah. I think sometimes I go for that a little bit. Yeah. Like it's not it, like it's less systematic. It's actually not systematic at all. Okay. Even yeah. if it sounds like maybe it could be, but it's definitely not. I was really proud. I wrote a piece about a year ago for solo cello. And it was like the first time. It's like all, all whole notes. Okay, I was so happy that I said well because it was like a simple. It was like it was like I don't think I could have gone any simpler than that. And it's like super slow. Now the re- it's for like it has like like this crazy intense uh, reverb and delay. Okay. So that's kind of how how why it works is just like these long tones, and then it's like this beautiful like but like yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah. Like sometimes when there's less happening, there's like it like you realize it opens up a window to like perceiving times. more. You know what I mean? If you look at the score, it is all white notes. Right. It's 100. There's no no sharp or flat at all. It's just white notes. Yeah. And it's actually very repetitive. You know yeah. what I mean? But some slight changes happen. And, and, that, and that's... I love that area of like where you... Where it's like you... you it's almost like you don't change, but you kind of change just enough mm-hmm. to keep the ear like perked up. You know yeah. What I mean? Well, that was the... That was the, the piece that that um, made me contact you. Oh, right. Uh, so, yeah, like I listened to Pulse on an NPR Tiny Desk content, or concert where uh, Eighth Blackbird was yeah. playing, and I'll link to that in the description. Yeah. And um, it just seems to be free. Yeah. Um, but it's very much in time. Yeah. And writing music with notation that sounds free, right. but is very in time, I yeah. think is like notation at its best. Totally. Because yeah. you're not hearing no- the presence of the grid, yet right. Yet you could hand that to someone yeah. and get the same music out of Absolutely. multiple ensembles. Yeah. And yeah, like just you have groupings of seven over groupings of five over groupings of six, and it doesn't sound like, what if I put seven over six no. over five? It's yeah. just beautiful and I can't I still can't believe how they how they can count it like it yeah. seems really difficult but it's hard but they yeah. do it effortlessly yeah I mean I think it's just one of those things that you just perform you just practice you mm-hmm. know um, if if you put your mind to it you you can definitely learn how to play seven against mm-hmm. six against five yeah. against four <laughs> you just uh, <laughs> it sounds hard everyone just needs to like arrive at their round beat together yeah. I think it's kind of like you get a sense of what the big beats are and, and you like you, you tune in to be like, let's arrive at the big beats together, and like don't listen to each other. Yeah, in the middle because it'll be too, be yeah. too confusing. How much are you there while they're rehearsing it to um, help them? Not a lot, and especially with something like that, I don't. I didn't have to help them with that at all. Like they figure that out themselves. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're but they're also like you know world class and professional yeah. group. Like yeah. if that was like a student group, it might be a little different. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, like, they definitely like learned it. Yeah, and then when I came into the rehearsal process, it was more just like let's refine, mm-hmm. you know, the the sound, or let's refine like dynamics, or mm-hmm. like just the balance of the texture, like who's foreground and background, yeah. that kind of stuff. You've got a bunch of chamber percussion music, and one group you write for is called Teague, and yes. I know they're your pals. Yes, and you do a lot of unconventional yes. percussion stuff with them. How do you? Uh, how does that work? Oh man. Okay, <laughs> so that has that's yeah, that's great. That piece was like. Definitely opened my mind to a lot of possibilities. Index of possibilities. Index of possibilities. Yeah. yeah. And um, 
So basically, they asked me to write a piece for them, mm-hmm. but they had just they were they had just finished school and moved to New York, and they. So if you're percussion, like let's say you're a guitarist, you, mm-hmm. own, you own your guitar. Yeah. Or if you're a violinist, you own your violin. Well, if you're a percussionist, like your your instruments, you could have you could play anything. You know, like a percussion instrument mm-hmm. is like anything under the the sun. Mm-hmm. So like a lot of percussionists, especially younger ones just starting out, they don't actually own a lot of their own instruments. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like it's expensive yeah. to own a marimba, a vibraphone, yeah. four thousand drums, and all these yeah. kind of stuff, right? Yeah. So like while you're in school, the studio has all that stuff, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. But so these guys just finished school and they moved to New York and like you know they're living in like shoe boxes and like don't own a lot of gear. Yeah. So they were like, we really like your music. We want you to write a piece for us, but you can only use things that we already own. Mm-hmm. So what I did was I went to their house and um, we just took out everything that they had, which was a kind of random assortment of ob- objects, you know. Yeah. And we just experimented, like making sounds. And I spent a whole day um, with my little recorder, like recording all the sounds we made and like kind of just riffing with them, like yeah. improvising a little bit. And then um, I went home and sifted through all that and picked a bunch of sounds that I really liked. Mm-hmm. And that's how I arrived at the setup for the piece. So like the piece has... Um, they're glass bottles, they're metal pipes, they're flower pots, mm-hmm. there's um, uh, saw blades, there's like school bell, there are other pieces of wood. Those things too. There's right? a, desk yeah, there's the desk bells. And then there are some normal drums, like there are toms mm-hmm. and kick drums too. Yeah. yeah, so that's how we arrived at that setup. It was mm-hmm. just, it was through the practical thing of like, yeah. let's just use what we can. A lot of folks, I think, feel they need to wait till the right conditions to finally write for orchestra. And that's how you be a composer. It's like, how could I be a composer? I don't know, you know, right. but it's all around you, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we were talking on the walk over here about like, like, you know, writing for sign tones and you yeah. post on that, sign waves and, all sign waves and stuff. And um, then we were talking about black MIDI and, mm-hmm. you know, I love that. Yeah. Like, black MIDI is, like, it's so cool. cool. Yeah. What is that? It's an amazing <laughs> sound. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you don't need an instrument for that. Yeah. It's just all on the computer. Yeah. It's really, like, like I, would, I don't even know how to do that stuff. So. I was I was trying to um, learn some of the parts from Conduit, because uh-huh. uh, I got the score, and um, there's parts in here where the virtuosic stuff is so fast it feels like just a gesture yes totally and, yeah. i was trying to point out that like on the page it's like 16th notes but it's just a gesture i mean 30 second notes it looks like it could be really hard but it's not actually that hard to play you know mm-hmm. and, and it's, I, I try to think about the instrument and the hands you know and it's a lot of notes but your hand's not moving mm-hmm. you know I mean? yeah, yeah. Piano. Like it's not actually yeah i mean <laughs> there are things in here that definitely get a lot yeah. better and also, like, especially because this one is about the yeah. touch gesture, it's very like, mm-hmm. repetitive. So, like, you know, you'll repeat the same thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's the idea. There you go. There you go. <laughs> I checked all my email. Yeah. Bad news. <laughs> Lots of bad news. Um, and, you know, stuff happens, actually, in rehearsal to, like, make it... Like, I think there was a version of this piece. So, okay, you get to this one part. It's like measure 208, where I have the pianists go like, um, they're like, they play. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like that. No, I when I first wrote it, I wrote out that as a scale. So I think my uh, first version was like. Uh, okay. <laughs> which is like really uh, hard. And then the pianist was like, you know, because all this other crap is happening. Everyone yeah. in the ensemble was making that gesture. Yeah. She was like, you know, that's like really hard to like play the scale. Yeah. Like, what if I just did a glissando? I see. And, the, and it sounded fantastic. Yeah. Like, just do the glissando. Yeah. And that's so much easier because. Yeah. Like, you know, it's, yeah. it's just physically, it's not actually that hard. It's, you know what I mean? It, it seems like the line is all about the range and the space right. and the right. rhythm. And yeah. The, exactly. yeah. Yeah. When I use notation, it's right. kind of blocky. Um, you know, oh, yeah. and that's really my problem. It's not yeah. a pro- It's not actually a limit of notation. It's just I think you have to be better at notation to avoid blockiness yeah. than you would if you just record when you write. Right. Um, right. Yeah, whereas totally. when you record when you write, you're limited to what you can play right. or what you can produce. And, right. 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 And when you notate, you can explore this like much more vast and much yeah, more specific. Yeah. Like I can't plan. play most instruments in this piece. Yeah. yeah. And and yet it sounds very cohesive and awesome and you got that and when it turned out a lot of the stuff that I heard that was so free sounding was 
time signatures changing measure by measure. Right. And yeah, the, and that happens especially like yeah, the last one. The last one, yeah. yeah. All the time. So the in send, yeah. the the it it all it doesn't sound like someone going one two one two three one two three right. four five six seven one two three four five one two three one two. It doesn't sound counted. Right. It just sounds like the proportion of the line is shifting in a way that's building and building yeah. and building. Yeah. And I think that's really an amazing thing that you're able to achieve in notation that I've learned is from from looking at your work is it's not that you're writing all this over a four four bar and then like coming up with um, this crazy like. Uh, um, like math equation to fit in four. You're just simply l looking at proportion for for everyone. Yeah. And and this way, like this, just really fluid way. Um, yeah, that's actually really interesting that you notice that this idea of like the the way the movie is like about ideas having their space, like give ideas expanding or contracting, mm -hmm. like the the fluidity of that. Yeah. That's 100 percent how I compose. Because yeah. like. I um, write, I have an idea, and I write it, and then a lot of times the way I'm, like, refining or developing an idea, mm -hmm. it's just a process of, like, listening and then feeling, you know, the energy wants it to go a little further, mm -hmm. so then I just expand it a little bit, and, and you know, and then there's the next yeah. phrase, and it's really just about trying to listen to the energy of the phrase, and yeah. if it feels like it wants to push a little more, I'll let it do that, or if it feels like you want to get back pull back a little more, I'll let it do that. Mm -hmm. So I'm not tying myself to any kind of like struct like meter structure. Yeah. I will have the I will change the meter to follow what I feel is the energy of the idea. Not vice versa. Mm -hmm. All kinds of music that I like from all kinds of different genres, there's a sense of like action and reaction. Yeah. You know, like if you're listen if you're in a band or if it's a or if it's a jazz ensemble or if it's like a chamber music thing mm -hmm. if you're playing with other people and you're really listening well you're always responding yeah. to what's happening around you and so I, like that idea of like some sound happens here has a, a consequence somewhere else mm -hmm. it's really important to me just this it's almost like like the physics like yeah. uh, the second law of thermodynamics right? <laughs> there's a reaction there's an equal and opposite yeah. reaction and I sort of think that's basic principle it, is functions in like right. ensemble playing music ensemble playing like any style it's where like, momentum comes yeah, from. yeah yeah so I try to I have to write that in yeah that and that's something um, that I've felt strongly in Book of Hours uh, which is a choral a piece for a choral and um, what would you call it chamber orchestra chamber orchestra like eight eight instruments eleven instruments eleven instruments and eight voices and, and wow yeah so like yeah. pretty epic yeah. and uh I felt like that that was the um, role of dynamics in that piece because right. to me that's a piece about loud and soft uh -huh. and um, and I that. and I thought about the harmony yeah. as like the harmony is what pulls you through yeah. and the dynamics are what make you feel the um, impact of the harmony. the vocal pieces I wrote you know last last year I really wanted it to focus on the voice and have mm -hmm. everything about it come from that point of origin so actually the way I wrote a lot of the book of hours music was um, they began as either just sketches that were just like some piano chords and then a melody mm -hmm. um, or just just the voice you know what I mean like and then I kind of built it up from there. And so, actually, it's kind of uh, sort of a fun thing to... Oh, no, this isn't a Book of Hours piece, but this was the piece I wrote be right before the Book of Hours. Ah, some handwritten stuff. Yeah, old-fashioned. Old-fashioned. Uh, where is it? Oh, yeah. So, like, this was this piece I wrote for two sopranos and chamber orchestra. And basically, there's a text. Yeah. It's a poem, a fragment from a poem by uh, Raina Maria Rilke. 
And I um, literally sat down at the piano with microphones and I looked at the text and I sang and I just improvised and I sang. This is a transcription of the improvisation. I mean, it's not an exact transcription, like I refined yeah. it as I transcribed it and yeah. like cleaned it up a bit, but like That's a good it's way pretty write. close to like what yeah. I improvised. Um, and, and the reason I did it that way is because I just wanted to respond to the text. Okay. I wanted to have the text and I wanted to mm. see what just yeah. came out. I just made all these like recordings of myself, like I put the words up on the piano mm -hmm. and then I would like be playing and singing and I record it. And sometimes it's just like random ass <laughs> stuff like, uh, oh, sorry, it's on mute. Like, <laughs> so, like noodling, it's, like it just sounds like. <laughs> Yeah, it just sounds like whatever, or like, uh, yeah, like, I don't know, it's just random stuff. Yeah. But then sometimes um, I get pretty close, actually. So we were just talking, we were just showing, talking about like, there's this one movement where the final product was like, uh, really actually quite close to the demo. So like, here's an example. This was a movement um, where the text was, I am much too alone in this world. Um, but not alone enough, <laughs> and um, which is a really amazing line. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so this this is like a demo where I was just again at the piano and singing along, and so I'll play like the before and after kind cool. of like the first idea, and then we can play a little bit of what it ended up sounding like. Hell yeah. <laughs> Like that was just an improvisation, totally spur of the moment. Yeah. And then um, here's like a little bit of what the kind of final version ended up sounding like. some sort of well-refined intuition you have from doing yeah. this for so many years that that kind of plays itself out and yeah totally you also know a good thing when you hear it right well that know, well so you know. so that's what we we're kind of talking about a little bit earlier about like how sometimes i doubt myself like i think it's too simple mm -hmm. and blah 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 this is a case where i was like i doubted a little bit i was like man this is really simple it's just like a melody and like like just whole notes chords yeah. but then i was like no no no, no. okay this sounds good yeah i'm not gonna mess with it I think it's so cool how much Robert changes his process to suit the instrumentation and mood of whatever he's working on. He's a great example of someone who uses his vast knowledge to push his curiosity further and doesn't make a bunch of walls for himself. I hope you enjoy the links to his music in the description, and for the record, I think his piece Conduit from the album Hand Eye is a great starting point. Thanks for watching and good luck out there.